So how are you guys doing? It's good to be back. It's good to see you guys. <laughs> well, thanks. Well, a few years ago, I took my two oldest daughters to an anime convention. Now, if you don't know what anime is, it, it means you're old. I don't know how else to tell you. But anime is at its heart Japanese animation. So it's comic books, it's movies, it's TV shows, it's graphic novels called manga. And I care nothing about any of those things. But it was important to my daughters and so it was important to me. So we go to this anime convention and when we get there, I realize I'm different than everybody else at the entire convention. First of all, I'm 25 years older than most of them. But also, I was wearing blue jeans and a t-shirts there were people dressed in some crazy costumes. I mean, they had painted their hair 10 different colors, their bodies 10 different colors. There were superheroes I'd never heard of. There were animals I've never seen. There were, there were things that I will never be able to unsee no matter how hard I try. And so I'm there and I realize I'm not in Kansas anymore. This is, this is different. And I realized at that point, I've got three options. One, I can be like them. I can put on a costume and, and act like I belong which was not going to happen. I could also just be, just survive it, just kind of count the minutes until I got to go home. Or I could realize I'm different, but I'm gonna enjoy this moment. I'm gonna thrive in this moment. And much to the embarrassment of my daughters, that's what I did. So I took pictures of the craziest costumes and sent them to my wife so that she could enjoy that moment with me. I had lots of great conversation about the different characters and I talked to people in line as we were waiting for different things and I just had a blast. It was a good day. Well, we're kicking off a brand new sermon series today called Thriving in Babylon where we're preaching through the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. A lot of you guys have heard about Daniel in the lion's den, but there's a lot more to this book of Daniel than that. At its heart, the book of Daniel is a survival guide for exiles. It is how to survive in a place that's not your own. It's also got a lot of prophecy in it. You may not know that. There's a whole lot of prophecy about different things in Daniel. The first, there's prophecy about things that happened after Daniel's time, but before our time. So he predicted the rise and fall of the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. And so what's so cool about that is we can look back at history and see that his predictions were very accurate. But he also predicted some things that haven't happened yet. He talks about the end of time when Jesus returns. And so we get to see that. And I would argue that you can't really understand the book of Revelation in the New Testament without understanding the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And so you Revelation geeks, you're going to love the last week of this ser sermon series. Daniel lived most of his life in a place called Babylon. Now, he was Jewish. He was born in Israel, but he was taken captive and lived his life in Babylon. He was taken captive by the king of Babylon. This all happens because God was punishing the nation of Israel for their disobedience. And so he allows a dude named King Nebuchadnezzar to conquer Israel. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was actually going to conquer Egypt. He went and conquered Egypt, and then on his way back home, he stopped by Israel and conquered them as well. And it took about as long to conquer Israel as it would take us to go maybe to Walgreens and pick up some toilet paper. But he conquers them, and that's part of this punishment of God. And if you read the Old Testament of the Bible, you see that a lot of the history of Israel in the Old Testament is a cycle of disobedience, punishment, repentance. And then there's a period of God blessing the nation of Israel again, but then it kind of goes back to them worshiping idols, them disobeying God, and the cycle continues. And this is all comes out of something called the Mosaic Covenant. It was this covenant between the nation of Israel and God where God would bless them and protect them if they obeyed the Old Testament law, including the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. But when Israel was disobedient, they broke this covenant with God, and so then God would punish them. And sometimes he would use other nations to do that. And in this case, he uses King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. But then the Jewish people would repent of their sins, and God would restore them back, restore their country back. But eventually, they'd go back to idol worship, and the cycle would continue. We had kind of a similar relationship with our youngest daughter when she was a young teen, there would be this constant, there would be the, I guess, uh, exile into the land of no uh, TV or screen time. 
Then there would be a lot of wailing and crying, followed by some repentance. Then there would be this beautiful period of peace, but then she would be disobedient doing the exact same thing she had done two days before, and we'd be right back into that same cycle. Well, after the Babylonian army conquers Jerusalem, King Nebuchadnezzar decides he's going to take some of the best and brightest young men of Israel back to Babylon to serve the king. And so Daniel is among that group, along with some dudes named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you'll hear more about those guys next week. They're taken back to learn to be in the king's service. And so Daniel is going to live the rest of his life as an exile in the nation of Babylon. And I looked up the the dictionary definition of exile, and it's one who's forced into absence from their country or home. That was Daniel. He was forced to live in exile outside his country. But Daniel doesn't just survive as an exile. He thrives. We see that he does some amazing things for God during this period of time. And what we learn is that as followers of Jesus, we're also exiles, that this world is not our home. We'll eventually go home. And so my hope and prayer is that we study this book of Daniel, is that we'll learn how to thrive as exiles in this world, and that you'll be challenged to live as an exile. All right, let's pick up Daniel's story in Daniel 1, 3 through 5. Then the king ordered Asphanaz, chief of the court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter into the king's service. So Daniel's taken to this foreign land to live with people who are different than him. They have different customs than he does. They eat different food than he does. And at this point, Daniel's got the same three options that I had at the anime convention. He can take the easy way out. He can live like the Babylonians and he can adapt to their culture and he can forget his true God that he worshiped. Or second, he could just try to survive the experience long enough for him to escape captivity and go back to Israel. Or the third option he had was he could choose to thrive and to make the most of that opportunity to serve God and to live a life that's full and rich. And and he doesn't have long to decide because as soon as he gets there, the first situation is going to come up where he's got to decide, is he going to live as an exile? Because he's ordered to eat food from the king's table and to drink the king's wine. Now, this was a problem for Daniel because Jewish law said that you could only eat certain foods and only prepared in certain ways. Now, there was a bigger problem with the king's wine and food, too, is Babylonians tended to sacrifice their food and wine to their false gods before they ate it. And so Daniel doesn't want to eat uh, food that has been sacrificed to idols. And so he's presented with this situation where he's got to decide, how am I going to live? Am I going to live as an exile, or am I going to give in to this new culture? Look at how Daniel responds. This is verses 8 through 17. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, look, I'm afraid of my Lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, he's talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. So Daniel is in this situation. He's ordered to eat this food that violates his religious law. But Daniel doesn't want to do that. And so he decides to live true to his faith, to be in exile, even though it could potentially cause some problems for him. And he decides to survive and not just survive, but thrive 
as an exile. He stays true to his religion. And here's the reality for us. If we're followers of Jesus in this life, if we're truly chasing after him, we're exiles. This world is not our home. We don't belong here. And so we've got to decide how we're going to respond to that. Are we going to stay true to our faith? Are we going to live as exiles even though it can cause us problems at work and with our friends and our family? It's not always convenient or comfortable to be in exile. Listen to what Jesus says about this in John 15, 18 through 19. This is Jesus talking here. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. In other words, you're in exile. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And so Jesus is telling us right up front, it's not going to be easy all the time to live as an exile. It's not always going to be comfortable. The world is not our home, and so it's not going to love everything we do. Then listen to how the Apostle Peter says this. This is 1 Peter uh, 2, 11 through 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, there's that word, exile, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Peter is saying, you are an exile. If you follow after Jesus, you're an exile. This world isn't your home, and people aren't necessarily going to love everything you do. And we need to understand that as followers of Jesus, being in exile isn't an option for us. It's who we are, or at least it, should, it is who we should be. Listen to how the Apostle John says this. This is 1 John, 1 John 2, 3 through 6. He says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. Listen to this. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. That's tough. That ought to scare us a little bit. If we claim to be a Christian, if we claim to be a follower of Jesus, to back up that claim, we have to live like Jesus. It's not an option for us. It's how we show our faith. Now, let me be real clear here. Obedience to the law is not how we're saved, right? We're saved by our faith through the grace of God. He loved us so much, Jesus died for us, that through our faith in him, we're saved. But if we have real life-changing, eternity-shaking faith, we're going to be obedient. It's how we're going to respond. It's how we're going to live. That's what it means to be in exile. And let me shoot straight with you guys right here. It's not always easy to be in exile. Sometimes it's difficult. It's not comfortable. It's, it's not convenient. But I think there's some things that we can learn from Daniel to not just survive in this period of being in exile, but to actually thrive and to make a difference in God's kingdom. If you want to thrive in this world as an exile, here's the first thing you need to know. It's not about guessing. It's about knowing. I think so many of us try to live our Christian faith kind of by guesswork. We close our eyes and we throw darts at a dartboard and we hope we kind of get close to the bullseye with how we live. But, but it doesn't work that way. That's not how this works. We, we think, look, God gave me a conscience, so surely that's enough to get me by on this holiness part and I can do what I'm supposed to do and live like I'm supposed to live. But it doesn't work that way. And we think, man, I don't really know how Jesus lived, but if I'm really nice to people, maybe I'm living like Jesus. That's not how this works. Let me, let me show you the, where this breaks down really quickly. If you think you live like Jesus if you're nice, that's not living like Jesus. When we really study and we understand Jesus' life, we understand Jesus wasn't always nice. That's going to shock some of you. are like, what? But Jesus wasn't always nice. He always was filled with love and mercy and grace. But he wasn't always nice. He would often say things that people didn't want to hear. He would often do things that upset people to get their attention. He was more interested in changing people than he was appeasing people. 
He was not always nice. And so if we're just nice, that's not what it means to follow Jesus and to live like Jesus. Just being polite is not what Jesus was. The love we're called to for the people around us is so much deeper than being nice. We're called to love people in a different way, to love people that are hard to love, to serve people that can't do anything for us. Our love, if it's going to be like Jesus, has to be filled with not just grace, but also truth. And we need to understand God's commands on holiness so that we can live that out. Look back at Daniel 1.8. He says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. How did Daniel know that it was bad to eat the food of the king? Because he knew the law. He had read the first five books of the Bible called the books of law. He had read those and probably memorized those. So he knew exactly what the law was so that he could live that out. You know, my kids have been driving for several years and I was involved in the process of helping them get their licenses. And here's what I know about that process. First of all, it's horrible and scary. But also, what I've learned is they won't even let you get behind the wheel until you take the class and learn the rules of the road. You have to learn the rules before you can get out and drive. And we have this book that sits on our phone and our computer, or maybe it's just a physical book sitting on a shelf gathering dust, that is our rule book for how to live as an exile. It teaches us that. If we don't read and understand the Bible, we can't do a really good job of living like Jesus because we don't know how he lived. And we can't do a real good job of following the rules of Jesus because we don't even know what those rules are. If you want to thrive in Babylon, you got to understand the rules. You got to understand what it looks like. Look, I, I get that some of you guys are intimidated by the Bible and some of you folks don't even know where to start. But we got so much help for you here at Karis City. We just kicked off fall community groups and these are in-home Bible studies. They started three weeks ago. If you want to get involved in that, you can go right out after service today and go to the Connect booth and get information about that. But each week we meet in homes and we study the Bible and we go deeper into the scripture that was preached on that way. We also have student ministry where our student pastor, Sean, meets every week with our junior high and senior high students and they go deeper into God's word and learn what it means to be an exile, what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We just kicked off our young adult ministry. So if you're between the ages of 18 and 35, you're out of high school, you can attend that. And part of that is a Bible study. I'm a little upset by that because they apparently won't let me attend. They say I'm too old. Get plugged in. We've got different Bible studies that you can get into. And those are great ways to get started. But you also need to get to a place where you can study the Bible on your own. That's just part of this. And if you don't know where to start, I tell you, start in the Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. John does a great job of explaining who Jesus is, why he came to earth, and how we respond to that. And, and so I would really encourage you to start there. Maybe you don't have much free time and you would say, Nathan, I work all the time, so I have a really hard time finding time to read the Bible. All right, use your lunch break at work. Find 15 minutes somewhere during your day to read the Bible. And you say, okay, I don't even have that. Well, listen to the Bible. You, the you version of the Bible will read the Bible to you. So on your way to or from work, spend a few minutes listening to the Bible. This issue is all about priorities. What do you value? Well, what's most important? The reality is where we spend our time tells us what we value. It just does. And Jesus wants to be more important than your job, more important than your family, more important than your hobbies. He wants to be number one. And he wants us to learn to live like him and then to live that out. See, we don't need to guess about what God's law is. We need to know God's law. Daniel was confident in following God's law because he knew what it was. All right, here's the second thing we learn from Daniel about being in exile. It's not about going, it's about growing. We have this tendency, we want to run, right? We want to go from thing to thing to thing. I think so many of us, when we hear a sermon like this, we create a spiritual to-do list. We say, we want to have patience. We want to have more mercy and goodness. We want to be generous and humble and empathetic and kind. 
And, and so we set out to do all of those things, and we have this list, and we go, go, go to try to accomplish it, and, and we forget to include Jesus in the process. And the reality is, if we try to accomplish this on our own, it's not going to work well for us. Look back at Daniel 1, 1 through 17. He says, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding. God gave. Daniel understood that he did not have the ability to do these things. He received that from God. He stayed connected to God. And look, the same is true for us now. Listen to what Jesus says in John 15, 4 through 5. He says, remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Listen to this last part. Apart from me, you can, be, you can do nothing. Jesus is saying that he is the power for life transformation. He is the power that we use. There, there's a big word, a big church word called sanctification. And sanctification is the process of looking less and less like the world around us and more and more like Jesus. You could also say that sanctification is the process of becoming an exile. And there's really two parts to this sanctification process. The first is where the power comes from. The first is what God does for us. God is the fuel source for sanctification. He is our power to be transformed. I think so many of us make the mistake of trying to rely on our own strength and we're trying to become a better Christian and live more like Jesus. We're trying to live out of our own power and it will not work. The way you do it is you become connected to Christ. Imagine it this way. Imagine that you uh, get up and it's errand day and so you decide you've got to run and get all these things. You've got to get some groceries so you write grocery store on your list. You need to get your oil change so you write oil change place. You've got to pick up a toy for your cousin for his birthday, so you write toy store. You gotta get some soap, and so you write that bath and body place at the mall. And you need to also pick up a broom, and so you write uh, you know, the broom store, whatever that is. Um, and you start running from place to place. And the day ends, and you've worn yourself out, and you hadn't gotten all your errands run. There's a different way you could have done this. Your list could have just said, Walmart. Right? You can do all of those things at Walmart. It's a one-stop shop for so many things. And the same thing is true when it comes to sanctification. Because we think, oh, I got, I got to run out. I got to grab some patience. And after that, I've got to find humility. And then I got to go over here and pick up a little generosity and self-control. And man, at the end of the day, I got to make it over and get some humility. And we wear ourselves out trying to accomplish all those things. And Jesus would say, Hey, it's all found in me. Connect to me, connect to the vine, and I will give you those things. He's the fuel. He's the one-stop shop for sanctification. Now, I think any comparison between Jesus and Walmart, it breaks down after that. So how do we connect with Jesus in a way that fuels and powers our transformation? We have to deepen our relationship with him. And there's a couple of things that I think we can do to do that. The first is prayer. And I know some of you go, oh, here we go again with prayer. Prayer is huge for connecting and strengthening your relationship with Jesus. If you want to connect with a friend, if you want to connect with your husband or wife better, if you want to connect with your boyfriend or girlfriend, what's one of the main ways you do that? You talk to them. If you want to connect to Jesus and grow closer to him and connect to the vine that gives you power, prayer is how we do that. We need to pray that God would empower us to be transformed, that God would help us live less like the world around us and more like Jesus. Recently, there was an article on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle about a lady named Linda Wilson Allen. I don't know if you read this. Linda Wilson Allen is not a scientist or a politician. She's not an athlete or an actor. She's a bus driver. Check out this picture of Linda. There's Linda right there. She's a driver for the San Francisco Metro System. This article happened because the, the writer for the San Francisco Chronicle rode her bus. And he realized that there was something different about Linda than anybody he'd ever met. 
His experience on her bus was different than any experience he'd had on a bus before. First of all, she learned his name very quickly, and she called him by his name when he'd get on the bus. But that was not unique. She did that for all her regular passengers, greeted them by name every day. One day he saw there was an older lady carrying groceries trying to get on the bus, but she was struggling to get the, her groceries on the bus. So Linda put the bus in park, got off the bus, helped the lady get all her groceries onto the bus, get settled into her seat. Another time there was a lady that got on the bus and Linda started talking to her and the lady said she was brand new to San Francisco and she didn't have any family or friends in the area. The next day was Thanksgiving. So Linda invited her over to her house for Thanksgiving lunch. And he realized there's something different about this lady. There's something different. And so he sat down to interview her and find out what it was. And here's what he learned. He learned at 2.30 a.m. every single day, Linda gets up and for 30 minutes, she gets down on her knees and prays to God. She prays to God that he would help her live a life that makes a difference. That he would put people in her way that need help, that need encouragement. She does not call bus driving her job. She calls bus driving her ministry. And then every day, God puts people in her way that need, maybe it's just bus fare. Maybe it's they need help with something in their life. Maybe it's just to be encouraged and told they matter and they're loved. And then Linda does something that we all can do, but so often don't do. She makes a difference. She lives in a different way. And this a reporter was so struck by this that he wrote an article about her. She's thriving in Babylon and making such a difference that she is on the front page of a major city newspaper sharing her testimony. And if you don't know much about the San Francisco Chronicle, they don't generally talk very nicely about Christianity. Linda gets the opportunity because of the way she lives to share her faith with her bus riders but also with an entire city by being on the front page. So when we think we're not in a position to make a difference and live like an exile, she's a bus driver. And yet she is making a huge difference in the world. And we're connected to Jesus and we're living like an exile. We grow spiritual. He can use us no matter what our job is, no matter who we're connected to. He can use us to do powerful things in his kingdom. Another thing we can do to be more connected to Jesus is to become connected to his church and to his people. We talk a lot about the importance of church attendance and being connected in a community group and serving with our different missions, events. Here's why. The more connected you get to other Christians who are living as exiles, the more you'll grow in your own relationship with Jesus because we encourage one another. We spur one another on. Daniel had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were bonded together. They supported one another in their life of exile. It's what we need too. Here's the problem that so many of you guys have living as an exile. You have 100, about 113 waking hours each week. So if you come to church for one hour and then you go back to regular life, less than 1% of your time awake is spent growing in relationship with Jesus. And that's not enough. And, and then the problem some of you guys have is you only show up at church a couple of times a month, and so it's even less than that. We have to be connected to Jesus' church and to his people. And through that process, our connection to Jesus as the vine grows. So if we're going to live as exiles, it's not about guessing, it's about uh, knowing. It's not about going, it's about growing. And here's the last thing we can learn about being in exile from Daniel. It's not about trying, it's about training. I said that there's two parts of this sanctification process. First is what God does, gives us the power to be transformed. But we have a part to play in this too. We have to train to be a follower of Jesus. We have to train to be an exile. I think so many of us, we have good intentions. We, we really want to be those things. We want to be in exile. We want to have more patience or kindness. We hear a sermon about sexual purity and generosity and serving others, and we say we're going to try to do better. And we have every intention of doing that. <laughs> but then we leave, and life gets hectic, and we go right back to living the way we were. And then we become frustrated and disappointed with ourselves that we don't change. But here's the reality 
to live more like Jesus, it's not about just trying to be different. It's about training. It's about doing little things every single day that move you to look more like Jesus. And then you're transformed over time. It's clear that Daniel was in constant training to live for God. The things he ate every day centered around God's law. We learn later in Daniel chapter 6 that Daniel religiously, three times a day, prayed at his window, looking back towards Jerusalem. And that was what was going to eventually get him in trouble and have him have lunch with the lions where he was the main course. But he lived day in and day out training to be the man that God was calling him to be. And the same is true for us. Listen to how the Apostle Paul describes this in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 25. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. He's saying how they get ready. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So it's clear that Paul loved sports. He was a Roman citizen and Greek and Roman culture loved the Olympics and Paul was a big fan of the Olympics. And so he's using this illustration here of how we train to be a follower of Jesus. And he's saying, look, it's not enough to just try really hard. Think about this. If you're gonna run a marathon and you just get up that morning and go, you know what? I'm going to go run this marathon, and I'm going to try as hard as I can. How's that going to end for you? Probably going to wind up in the hospital. It, it doesn't work that way. You're not going to be an Olympic athlete by signing up and then going and trying your very best to win that event. But, but wouldn't it be awesome if the Olympics was a little more like American Idol, where there was at least a few people that had no idea what they were doing and weren't very good at it? So maybe in the Winter Olympics, you get some dude that's never really skied up on top of that big ski jump ramp, and then you just push. Or maybe you get five regular dudes in a bobsled and just let them go down the tube and see what happens. That would be awesome, but it wouldn't work very well because you can't do that. Being an athlete is more than just trying hard. It's about training. Athletes give up things that hurt their training, and they do things that help their training. My guess is that Blizzards are not part of the training process for an Olympic athlete, and so they give those up. They then do cardio training and resistance training and all these different things that help them get ready. And Paul's saying the same thing to us as Christians. He's saying our part in this sanctification process is to do little things every single day to train ourselves to look and live more like Jesus. And so we have to cut out some things that hurt our training and add in some things that help our training. So let me give you a few examples. If you struggle with lust, then you need to give up some things that cause that in you. You need to watch different TV shows and movies and internet content. Maybe even some TV shows that aren't a problem for your friends may cause you to have those feelings. And so you need to give those up. That's part of your training. If you struggle with drinking too much, don't hang out in bars. Don't hang out with your friends that also drink too much. Hang out with the people who are also striving to live as exiles and follow after Jesus, people that can encourage you to be sanctified. If you want to be a thankful person and you want to be more thankful in your life, don't just go, hey, I'm going I'm to be more thankful. Every day, think about what it looks like. So maybe you get up every morning and you think of three things that day that you're thankful for and you pray to God before you go to work for those thankful things. Maybe you create a, a journal or a log of all the things you're thankful for. Maybe at night it means making out a list of what happened during your day that you're thankful for, and then you give God praise and glory for those things. Now you've become your, begun your training, and over time you'll become a more thankful person. If you need to be less selfish and focus on serving others, don't just make a commitment to be less selfish. Have a plan. Go into training. Decide that every day you're going to say some words of encouragement to a coworker or a friend or a family member. And make sure you do that. Stop by a homeless person once a week and encourage them. Give them some food or some, uh, some money and encourage them and tell them Jesus loves them. And we've got lots of ways you can serve other people and become less selfish. You can be part of our homeless ministry uh, that we do. We've got an event coming up called Suppers and Showers on Tuesday. You can still sign up for that. You can serve at-risk veterans with our church. We have a ministry that we partner with called Hearts for Heroes that serves those guys and girls. 
If you want to serve young single moms that are struggling to make it with their babies, we can be a part of two lives changed. If you do those things and you begin to serve in that way, you're training. You're, you're becoming more like Jesus by putting people before yourself. All right. So to live like exiles, it's not about guessing. It's about knowing. It's not about going. It's about growing. And it's not about trying. It's about training. I think there'll be a tendency for some of you guys to discount this sermon a little bit. Some of you will think it really doesn't apply to you, that you're living fine. Some of you will have good intentions. You'll think, man, I need to make some changes. But you'll go home and, man, it'll get busy just this afternoon and work's coming tomorrow. Eternity seems so far off, but work is tomorrow and there's a lot to get done. And so you'll go back to the things that you did before. There's a lot of reasons not to do anything differently, not to live as an exile. Not living as an exile, it's easier. It's usually more convenient. Doesn't draw bad attention to yourself. And goodness, man, eternity is so far away. It's so far off in the future that you've got lots of time to change how you live in the future. But the reality is this. Eternity is not nearly as far away as you think it is. Do you guys remember a false missile warning in Hawaii several years ago? Do you remember reading about that? People were on the Hawaiian Islands. They were, the locals were there, but also people on a dream vacation. There were lots of people that were sitting at breakfast or sitting in their hotel rooms, waiting to go to the beach a little later in the day. And suddenly their phones went off and started saying that no, missiles are coming from North Korea. In 20 minutes, they'll be there. Loudspeakers were blaring all over the islands, warning that they needed to take shelter to avoid the missiles. And, and so those people that thought they were going to be at the beach having their dream vacation are suddenly hiding in closets, hiding under tables at their breakfast restaurants, calling loved ones, saying goodbye. And suddenly they realized that eternity that they thought was so far off was right there. And I wonder, I have to think there were people under those tables at restaurants that thought, I wish I'd have done this a little different. I wish I'd have thought about things a little different. And I wondered if we followed up with those people years later, if any of them would say, you know what, I've changed some things about the way I live my life because I had that moment of reality where I realized that eternity is not that far away. Hopefully it was a blessing. What if we all lived like eternity was right around the corner? Well, what if we all lived every day as an exile? Being in exile is not an option for Christians. It's not for extra credit. It's not for bonus points. It's not a, uh, an elevated class to get the master's degree. 1 John 2 through 5 through 6 says, This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. So let me ask you the tough question Can you back up your claim to be a Christian? Do you live like Jesus? If we were to take a poll of your friends and your coworkers, would they say, he lives just like everybody else or that you live by an exile? Here's the reality. What we do in this life echoes into eternity. What we do here makes all the difference there. And what we are called to is to live as an exile. Thriving in Babylon means that we live each and every day like it's our last. That we chase after Jesus, his holiness, his perfection, his love. And if you do that, you're going to find and be blown away by what Jesus does in you and through you. Let's pray.